Hello and welcome to another edition of Surviving Scientology Radio. This is your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Today with us on the show is Matt Pesh. Matt, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. i got to tell you, Matt, and you've used other names, for example, in, uh, what was it, 2009, I went to Steve Hall's blog and I started reading bedtime stories, Little Dickie's Bedtime Stories. Oh, yeah. Now, for people who don't know, you and your lovely wife, Amy Scobie, were leaking behind the scenes, telling stories using the Little Dickie series. Right. What now? You were you still in the church when you started telling these stories? No, we had we had left uh, in 2005, and we started telling the stories in uh, November 2008. So you, the Little Dickie, and I recommend anyone just put in Little Dickie, D-I-C-K-I-E, Scientology, and just read, and they are amazing. Uh, you were still under the radar when you were leaking these stories, right? And they talk about David Miscavige. Right. They talk about Imp Base, Flag Lamb Base. So when I was reading them, not knowing who you were, I thought it was one person. I didn't realize it was a husband and wife. Mm -hmm. And I thought it had, had to be someone who was in Sea Org at a high level. Right. What was the highest post you held in the Sea Org? Well, I, at, in, at the Imp Base, I was the first security chief up there. I was also uh, the production exec for Gold. Um, and I ran the rentals and stuff up there. And then uh, by the time I got to FLAG, I was a captain FLAG crew. I was also the descent sec for the FLAG service organization. And I was also the treasury secretary for the FLAG service organization for about seven years. Going back to being the first security chief at Imp Base, mm -hmm. maybe you can help me here clear up a misconception about uh, Imp Base at that time. Were you there for the first big flood? Yes. What, you know, there's a, there's a story that goes around the internet that there was this just monstrous uh, thunderstorm in Hemet. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, it's a flash flood. For people who've never been in the desert like I have or you have, when a flash flood comes, it's a lot of rain all at once, unbelievable amounts. Is it true that the flood was threatening uh, to flood in base and a bulldozer was used to break the dike and push the water down toward the city? Uh, we didn't use a bulldozer to break the dike. One person went around with a shovel at that point and broke the dike on the, on the uh, Hemet side. Uh, we were fighting that thing for about, I don't know, two or three days. And I mean, that river was raging. It was the big concrete slabs that were on the side of it were just being peeled off and spun down the river and trees were being sucked down, huge trees. And it was... It was nasty, and we kept trying to put more dirt there with our bulldozer and all the kid, you know, all the different guys shoveling, and and we were we were losing out. They, uh, our side was about to break, and we had just made the first uh, studio there to make the films, so it was really we felt like we couldn't lose that studio. So uh, one of the staff members went around the other side. It was that night. It was raining hard, and he went over there and poked a hole through, and it busted on their side first. And just a few minutes later, it busted on our side, but the uh, majority of the water had already gone towards Hemet, so believe it or not, it came within an inch of uh, the height to go inside our studio, and uh, that's what happened that night. But it goes to kind of the mentality that you save Scientology bef yep. <laughs> before before a Wog City, yep. and... Uh, well, I'm glad you cleared up that because I didn't know if it was real or true. One thing we want to do at uh, Surviving Scientology Radio is to clear up misconceptions. At that point, are you serving L. Ron Hubbard personally or the Sea Org? Or what do you feel like you're serving at that point in your life as a young man? You know, I came into the Sea Org after just doing one little communications course in New York. I really wasn't, I didn't know anything about Scientology, and I kind of got right into the renovations in Los Angeles. And then I got sent to... Uh, you know, to the gold uh, Hemet and working on the renovations there. And I'd really hadn't really even become a Scientologist hardly. Really, it's it's you know it's funny to think that when they asked me if I wanted to go work where LRH was, I'm thinking, why would any, anybody want me to go work where LRH is? What do they need somebody to rake his leaves or something? I don't know anything about Scientology. <laughs> so you know, I was just trying to get by. You know, just doing what was needed. And I really always wanted to learn construction, and uh, I had a big opportunity to do that in both Los Angeles and at Gold. Well, now that's interesting. So your approach into Sea Org is to learn uh, a valuable 
trained. Yeah, ever since I was a little kid, I wanted to learn construction. And, you know, when they showed me videos that they were doing renovations and construction in Los Angeles and I could go there and work, I was like, I left the next day. I thought, hey, this would be a good opportunity to to learn this stuff. You know, I was as, as interested in that as I was in Scientology. Over time, would you say you became a Scientologist, a very doctrinaire Scientologist? You know, I didn't become a Scientologist really until uh, I got sent to the RPF in 1983. I got sent to the RPF from Gold, and then that was the first time I actually learned how to like the, the use an e-meter or audit somebody or get auditing. And, you know, that's I would say that's when I became a Scientologist, when I got sent to the RPF. That's very fascinating, Matt, because you echo what so many people have said that they, in the Sea Org, it's work all the time, mm-hmm. 16, 18 hour days, seven days a week, maybe a day off every other week if your stats are up. Then they go to the RPF, then they get some auditing, they read some books, they get some enhancement, uh, along with the hard, brutal work. Right. How long did how long were you in the RPF in 1983? Uh, let's say I went there in October. And I, in 1983, October, and I got out in about June of 85. Now, when when you completed the RPF, was there a, an EP you had to have? In it? I mean, was there some result the church wanted you to have? Were you a compliant Sea Org member now? Yeah, you got to like, <laughs> it's funny, you know, you got to kind of convince them that whatever they had as a problem with you is not there. And I got sent there for being quote, disaffected, and uh, I actually did the pilot on what's called the Truth Rundown, funny enough, and, uh, you know, you see something that isn't right, and you voice it, but it's not popular what you voice, and you're supposed to do this Truth Rundown to see that you actually didn't see what you saw, so that was funny. I mean, I'm asked after we, you know, you do this little bit of ordering, you know, now do you see how that wasn't that way? And I'm thinking to myself, oh, no, I see how it exactly it was that way. But, you know, you'd say to the auditor, yeah, you know, you see that that wasn't, the, wasn't right. Because you want to get out of the RPF, there's no way you're going to get out of the RPF if you don't play along. You pretend like, you know, you, you've changed in that way, you know, your viewpoint changed. Matt, would I be correct in saying then that at least what you experienced of, of the truth run down was thought stopping or thought reform? Yeah, they're trying to get – they're trying to – Get you to convince yourself that what you saw never happened, you know, that you, you made it up because of something you did wrong prior to that. Scientology is sort of an engineered process where you're deliberately thought stopping. Right. And you're deliberately doing that in order to be a good Sea Org member. So that's sort of perhaps why it's considered a religious cult by many because of the thought modification programs. Right. Now, you leave RPF, where do they assign you now that you're thinking the way they want you to think? It was funny, they had a, because I came from gold and I was supposed to never be, I was supposed to kick, get kicked out of the CO. And uh, so gold stopped paying me. I didn't get paid at all when I was in the, in the RPF. I got zero. And uh, it wasn't until like the last few weeks that I was in the RPF, the uh, person that was in charge of estates in, in Los Angeles, I was doing some work and he was talking to me and, you know, he said, where are you going to be? How you doing on the program? I told him I'm almost done. And he said, where are you going to go when you come out? And I said, you know what? I said, uh, you pay me, and I'll come to your organization and work for you when I get out. So just the last few weeks of the uh, RPF, he started paying me. And uh, when it came out of the RPF, then Gold tried to grab me and use me as a trade to get somebody else from AO. And they had already gotten the staff from AO, and then AO was saying that I was there. It was this big fluffle. But really, I just went and I worked for the for estates that paid me, and I started there. That's that's kind of what happened. Did they want you because of your construction skills? Yeah, yeah. Now, going back one minute, where they were, people were arguing over uh, you. You know who got you? Right. Sea Org members are often called coins, correct? Completely. You were a coin. A that coin. is. Now, can you tell our listeners what it means to be a coin within Scientology? A coin is, you know. The organization basically owns a staff member, and they can take that staff member and trade them for other staff members from a different organization. And that's what was happening. You know, Gold had basically thrown me away, but, you know, not expect me to finish your RPF. But once I finished, then they were trying to grab me as their coin. They actually used me and did a trade and got a person from a different organization. But I wouldn't go to that organization because I said, you know, Gold doesn't 
is I'm not gold coin. They haven't paid me for two years, you know. So I, I just went with the uh, the estates of uh, you know the, in Los Angeles. Man, did it ever feel dehumanizing to you to be considered a coin? Yeah, for sure. And you know, and dehumanizing to be considered somebody that doesn't even deserve RPF pay. You're not going to get paid at all for two years. You know? <laughs> and yet, I was. The, I, I became the person running the RPF. I was the RPF bosun, like the head person, most you know, like a leader within the RPF itself. You know, it was funny. Well, when you have no money at all, when you're not even getting RPF slave pay, what do you do when you need anything? Um, it was. Fun. <laughs> I mean, basically, uh, I remember I got uh, two pairs of sneakers given to me by uh, my wife, who was up at at uh, Int at the time, and I sold one of the pair of sneakers <laughs> to get a few bucks, so I had something for toothpaste or, or uh, soap or something. You know, that's basically it. That's the only thing I I was uh, had money to buy. I understand that. You get by however you can. So you are out of RPF up in Los Angeles in the States. What happens next? Uh, I got sent to do what's called missions, like they're like projects that you run on. And uh, this was for CC Int. They were going to renovate that building there, the, uh, you know, the, the main building, the, the, the real nice building. They have. Yeah, the, the big manor. Yeah, the big manor. And uh, so I went there and I, I did a whole workout of what it would take to fix each of the different systems in the building. I did uh, a whole layout on you know blueprint of the property and every plant and made a tree on it and all the elevations. I basically laid out and did all the homework on what it would take to renovate that, that whole property. So that's a multi-million dollar project, I imagine. Yeah. Did, did you have charge of the renovation or did you move on from there? I moved on from there because my wife at the time was now at FLAG and she wrote to David Miscavige uh, and asked that I be allowed to go to, you know, go to uh, FLAG and replace the person that was running renovations there who wanted to go to Los Angeles and we just do a swap. So she did a petition to Miscavige. Man, I got to tell you, it, it is a uh, complex skill set to be able to put down on paper how to renovate a facility, electrical, plumbing, mm -hmm. life, life safety systems, lighting, everything. Yep. So you obviously have a valuable skill set, and is that why FLAG wants you, and that's why they agree to the swap? Oh, yeah, they, they definitely want me. I, I've, I've got a reputation because I ran the renovations and stuff up at Gold for years, so they – I had a reputation of being somebody who could get, you know, projects done and, and knew what I was doing on that. And, uh, yeah, that's what happened. No, I, well, I wanted to make the point that many, many Sea Org members have very sophisticated skill sets that are worth a lot of money in the non-Scientology world. So you're basically a construction manager. Right. How, what kind of condition was the Fort Harrison in, in general? What was your impression of it? You know, it was unbelievable. It was unbelievable. Um I mean, I, I want to do a walkthrough of the rooms because, you know, I was responsible then. The whole idea was to renovate the building from the top down. So I sure. start walking through the rooms, and, and uh, literally I could see people's legs in their showers from the hallway. That's how big holes were in the wall. The, the, wow. the carpets in the hallways were ripped to the point where you could see concrete. The lights were hanging down from the ceiling, broken. Um, you go into the rooms and the chairs would be mismatching and, and you, like, you know, 50 years old and the springs were like broken in them, the mold on the walls, the, the tile in the bathrooms had fallen off and the bathrooms and the, the handling in those days was these guys were taking shower curtains with plastic and duct tape and, and covering the walls to make them quote unquote waterproof. I mean, I mean, you could see the concrete floor in many of the rooms through the through wear through the carpet. I mean, it was that nasty. And, and, uh, I went well, Matt, let me, let, let me jump in yeah. here. Is, is this a building that should have been condemned? You know, they almost had it condemned before I got there. And, uh, the city came very close to condemning it based on fire regulations. And, uh, they went through over the weekend and took sheetrock and mud and plaster and just kind of docked it, you know, just slap shit over holes and stuff like that to make it pass to keep to even be able to keep occupancy in the building. On the Fort Harrison, was that your experience that they would have been better off to demolish it and build a new hotel? Yeah, so, I mean they they should have gutted it wall to wall, you know, ten thousand square feet per floor. The uh, 
the rooms are, are like I guess the buildings must be from like the 1920s or something. The rooms are very small. The bathrooms are extremely tiny, and that you know they wanted to make this a really nice hotel. Well, you're already limited by the, the amount of space you have in the rooms for one, which isn't very good. And then there was so much mold and rot of the walls themselves. Really, the best thing to have done would be to gut the, the building, the whole thing inside, and just rebuild it again. And uh, but you, it's, it's like take it, like take take it down to structural steel. Yeah, take it down to the external walls and structural steel, and then reframe it up and re put it right. Because we re we wound up re sheet rocking every square inch of the floor anyway. You know, might as well have just you know put something there for real. Do you think the church wasted a lot more money doing it their way than, you know, the st a standard way? Of course, but I'll tell you, this is how bad it was. When I walked through the rooms and I, you know, I was told to go up there and see what it was going to take to renovate these these uh, rooms. So I come back down and I said, man, you know, this place is worse than a Motel 8, right? I mean, and that's, that's <laughs> not this statement, right? Yeah. And I said, you know, we're going to need to do something major here. Oh, man, I got, you know, this was supposed to be uh, uh I got sent in to get a sick check right away. You know, how could I be saying that the building was that bad? You know, uh, Laura Inglehart, who, who was in charge of the uh, estates at that time, what she wanted me to do and the crew to do is to go through with glue and, you know, where the wallpaper was falling off the wall, re-glue it up, do touch-up paint. I, for <laughs> real, for real. That's what she wanted, right? And I'm like, yeah. I felt so exhausted. I was just like, couldn't even, I wanted to just sit down like, what are you talking about? You know, I am not going to go through these rooms with a little cart and, and touch up paint and some glue or something, you know. you got to be kidding me. And the only thing that saved me was the woman who was the uh, COCMO CW, Clearwater, at that time. You know, she came to the rescue and said, no, you know, we're not going to just do touch up glue jobs and shit. You know, we're going to at least, you know, do some kind of major renovations here, which was which was good. Which so the project got funded to do major renovations. How big was your crew? How big was your budget? Uh, we were doing a floor for around $165,000 per floor. That's 10,000 square feet, and that's, that's you know, re sheet rocking every square inch, all new wood moldings, redoing the bathroom, the plumbing, the electrical, the phones, the, uh, the new furniture, uh, you know, new locks. I mean, it's incredible that we were able to do that for that kind of price. Well, sure, but, you know, you don't have labor. You have basically Sea Org labor, yep. which saves you a lot of money on a project. At the same time, the church is trying to put out this phony PR that remodeling the Fort Harris and the jewel of Clearwater will only enhance the beauty, prestige, and real estate value of downtown Clearwater. Is that selling locally? I can tell you it was very antagonistic. The people were extremely antagonistic to Scientology. During the Lisa McPherson routine there, yeah, there was never a time where the public were more uh, antagonistic against Scientology. When Lisa McPherson dies, what post are you in at Flag Land Base? I'm the Treasury Secretary for the Flag Service Organization. What happens at the base? What's it like to be a member of the Sea Org when Lisa McPherson dies and it makes international news? You don't know it makes international news. You're, you're just you're a Sea Org member. You don't have TV, radio, newspaper, magazines. You don't have cell phone. You don't have nothing. And so you're oblivious to what's happening on it, on outside. You, usually, most Sea Org members don't even know what's going on in the next building or in the next division in their own organization. Really, like. Like I, I, would, I used to say, you know what, the rest of the Sea Org in, the, in Los Angeles and Gold and these places could be gone and we wouldn't even know about it. I mean, that's how, that's how contained information is within the organization. So you're just told there's a flap, um, you know, all these evil people are trying to attack us and OSHA will handle it. And all we need from you as the staff here is to do your jobs even better, you know, and that's basically But, man, that's very intriguing and I'll tell you why. Earlier we had talked about thought reform in RPF. Mm -hmm. What you see, you didn't see. Right. It's almost like Men in Black, that song that, you know, in, in Will Smith's movie, What You Think You See, You Didn't See. Right. So you basically, Lisa McPherson dies, you don't know that it's an international story, that it could involve David Miscavige and potentially criminal charges. No idea. And you're told to keep your head down and keep working. Did you, act, well, did you actually know that Lisa McPherson had died in the Fort Harrison? Yeah, I knew that. 
And what, what? how were you briefed? Were you briefed by OSA? Yeah, we were briefed by OSA. The staff were brought into the auditorium. Uh, OSA briefs us that, you know, a girl, a woman in the public had gone, uh, had a psychotic break, and the church had tried to help her, and she died from, you know, something that happened in a car accident, and now, you know, there's a family that she has trailer trash, people from Texas that don't even, relatives that don't even really know her, are trying to make money with some ambulance chasing lawyer, and it's all about the money, and, uh, you know, so OSA's on the, on the job, they're going to handle this, just do your job. Now, you, this is very valuable, what you're telling our audience, this is the first time we get to hear the real uh, short story from an insider, so they tell you that she died as a result of injuries sustained in a car accident. Mm -hmm. Her family is a bunch of trailer trash from Texas yep. with an ambulance chasing lawyer who's just trying to make a quick buck off the church. Yep. That is so utterly cynical. <laughs> it, it's breathtaking and it's cynicism and it's a flat out lie. Right. Do they ask you, now you're Treasury Secretary at this point, uh -huh. do they ask you to spend money legally in in the least McPherson matter or does that come out of OSA legal? No, it comes, it, you know. I, I mean, I asked because she died at the Fort Harrison, so who has to pay the legal bills? Well, at the time when it happened, I had about, oh, I'd say about $25 million in reserves from the, the uh, flag service organization. Yep. I emptied that. that. That all went to legal. And from the weekly financial planning, additional to that, we were taking hundreds of thousands out a week for quite a long time, I can tell you. And sometimes, you know, there would be almost no money left for the organization to, have to even be able to do anything itself. Like our financial planning was like raped because money was just being pulled out to go to that legal uh, fighting, you know, although. Well, you were privy to, to a lot of things because you, you had control of the checkbook of the money. Right. One very specific thing I'd like to ask you about, mm -hmm. Alexander Gench uh -huh. was sexually molested by a Sea Org member at Flagland Base. Right. He was 12 years old. She was about 40. Yep. This is discovered, the, uh, the sexual molestation. What happens once this is discovered? Um, basically what happens in that kind of situation, and that ain't the only one of those. That, that's, there's been a number of those. And what happens is um, the people are gotten out of the state immediately. So, you know, for me as a Treasury Secretary, I need to find money and cut a check and get plane tickets and those people are gone. They're, they're shifted someplace, you know, depending on So, who Osa, are. the Office of Special Affairs sends Alexander somewhere and the woman who rapes him somewhere else. Right. And you just write the checks. Yeah. You said that it, that there were more, I mean, how many sexual molestations were you aware of at Flagland Base of, of children? Shit. Um, I mean, it sometimes it was adults too. Um, Let's see. So, I mean, there was rapes of adults, too, but let me see. Really? Yeah. Um, a children, I don't know, I can think of two right off, you know, Alexandra and, and a, about a 12-year-old girl. And then so there's rapes where, where men raped women? Mm -hmm. And this doesn't get reported to the police. No. This is shocking that the church intentionally covers up felony sexual rapes or sexual molestations. Yep. And its handling is to get the people out of the state, out of the jurisdiction. Yep. Marie Warren, the uh, the woman who, who sexually molested Alexander Gench, and you confirmed this online when Karen first posted the story, and we're, we're deeply grateful to you for doing that because the truth must come out. Marie Warren, the woman who molested Alexander Gench, she became an OSA operative. Mm -hmm. And... It's mind-boggling to think she, she commits a sexual felony. Then, then she becomes an OSA operative. <laughs> the thing, Matt, is Scientology is not an abstract thing. It's actually made out of people right. doing things. It's made out of people doing their jobs every day. One of my friends who was once a high-ranking executive said, you don't appreciate, Jeff, that the Church of Scientology is made out of thousands of people working long hours every day. 
that's one reason it's so tough. How do you feel uh, on a human level seeing this? Is it, is, 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 it, is it, again, does your thought stopping kick in? Yeah, I mean, you're, you're kind of mentally geared that the survival of the group is everything and the individual is secondary or, you know, big time, you know. But you yourself then, because the Sea Org, the Scientology in general, Sea Org in particular, says no case on post, mm -hmm. no HENR, no human emotion or reaction. So you learn to not only turn off your thoughts, but turn off your feelings. Yeah, you do. Yes, you do. But when you have that bottled up inside, I mean, something eventually breaks. It snaps. Mm -hmm. What what, ha what happened with you? When did it break? You know, it's a gradient, you know, uh, I mean, one of the real wake up calls for me was we were at a staff meeting where you have all the staff on Thursday night, you know, you get together and you go over to production of the week and your plans for the next week and, and it gets announced by the captain and it was not her idea, you know, this is obviously pushed down from RTC, but sure. what she's announcing is there is not going to be any more special schedules for those who are old or sick that can't do the complete full schedule. If you can't do the complete full schedule, then you will be fitness boarded out of the sea or you're giving your couple hundred bucks or whatever and hit the road. And I was like, holy shit, man, I've already been here for a long time, you know, and uh, what am I going to work until I can't work no more? I can't do 100 hours a week and then you're going to throw me in the street? That, that ain't going to work for me, you know? Now, let me get this straight. So you're in a meeting and they say, look, if you can't cut it, Hit the bricks. Here's your $500 severance pay. Mm -hmm. Hit the street. You're out of here. Right. I mean, that's very Darwinian, but it corresponds exactly to what I've always thought. The Sea Org wants people in that really specific life band of about 15 years old to maybe 50, 55. Right. That prime period where you're healthy and you can work long hours, but when you weekend, get out we don't want you yep. I mean we all get we all age you know and you hope to think that as you get older you get life will become a little bit easier but if you can't cut the long hours you're out so that's kind of a that's for you really shocking because you must know older Sea Org members at that point sure and and uh, you know you, you're told all the way through that don't worry you know when you get old you'll be taken care of and stuff and you know, the Sea Org actually has a problem. When I joined in 78, the average age was probably between, the average age of a Sea Org man was probably between 20 and 25. And as time went on, I would say by now, the average age of a Sea Org member has got to be somewhere between 45 and 50. And as time goes on, the Sea Org gets older and older as an average age. And uh, and it's, it's a problem because there's a lot of medical expenses for someone as they get older. And I can tell you, from being a Treasury Secretary, uh, it's it's nasty because there ain't the, there isn't the money for it, and then these people are really put in bad situations. Matt, you bring up an excellent point. I drive down L. Ron Hubbard way often enough. I, I live nearby, so you know I I, dr I go by. I do notice there is a gray a graying or an aging of Sea Org members. Right. Correct me if I'm wrong, but the general policy, the health care plan of the Church of Scientology works this way. They have workman's comp insurance that they pay for. Right. So they try to cover almost everything they can under workman's comp. They try to shoehorn it in there. And basically, since Sea Org members work all the time, any injury they get is work-related. Now, if it's not workman's comp, let's say if you wake up and find you have cancer, you're off on the county medical system on the taxpayer's dime. Does that summarize it? Yeah, I mean, I don't even remember ever using workman's comp because I know the concept was not to use the workman's comp because they would raise the insurance, <laughs> believe it or not, you know. So it's really to send, uh, if you get sick or hurt, you go off to county. Yeah, I mean, if you're that, yeah, yeah. Even though, in, in this, this, the reason I asked Matt, it violates uh, the very principle of exchange. Mm -hmm. So, in other words, the Church of Scientology, if they give you audit and they want your money, if they're giving you room and board as a Sea Org member, they want your labor. Right. But it's out exchange just to take county welfare dollars to treat their own sick and infirm. Yeah, and, and the same thing with abortions. They, they, they have so many girls getting abortions that 
they sent them to different counties so that they, it's not such a such an obvious thing of how many girls are coming from the church to get their abortions. They they literally drive them to different areas for the clinics for the abortions. So they have to spread it around to hide yep. it. Um, as Treasury Secretary, you have a high level. How much money did this flag bring in in an average week when you were on post? Uh, probably about 1.7 million. You know, that's that's just for the flag service organization. Then flag crew does about another 200,000. And then you have various different units like the IS. They'll do another, you know, 200,000 a week. Uh, and then you have all kinds of way to happiness and you know, preservation of the tech and all these other type of red units are sitting there, all trying to shark feed off the same people. So really, you could do over two million a week at Flag. Yeah, on average, what takes gets taken away from the public, like altogether from Scientology at Flag, no yeah, way, is probably let's see, it's well over two million, maybe two point five. So it's over. So let's just call it two point two million dollars right. as a ballpark, okay? Yep ranging from two to 2.5 million and it's all tax-free money right. okay now i am david miscavige for the sake of talking correct mm -hmm. i see my 2.2 million dollars coming from flag How, where does the money go under the lrh their church finance policy what happens to that 2.2 million dollars in a week well i mean of the 1.7 from FSO, one of my little dicky stories actually breaks down with the financial plan. Oh, I'll, yeah, I'll get yeah, the link and series post seven, it. Yeah. Series 7. Okay. Series 7 uh, actually breaks down exactly uh, how an FSO financial planning would be. We'd get about 300000 of the $1.7 to reinvest into the organization. Now what, ha now, what does reinvestment mean? Well, about half of that goes to promotion, like printing promo and mailing it. Um, and then you have, you know, the pay, which is about 50 bucks per person. If there's full pay that week, there could be zero pay. Um, and then you have tours that are you know, like three different tours that are moving around to the different churches on the planet. And so they need to be funded. You have phones, you have medical, you have, um, you know, it kind of, it kind of breaks down into the little expenses that each of the divisions need to keep going. And then now the rest of the money goes up lines. Yep. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a question I'd like you to educate our readers on. People say, you know, who are in the sphere like you, money moves up lines. What does up lines mean? Up lines has to actually be somewhere. So where does the rest of the money go? Well, first of all, there's an allocation form. So on that allocation form, uh, you have a person from in finance that is at flag and is actually this representative in every single major church on the planet and it's it's uh it's an in finance staff member and now does that mean does that mean church of scientology international yeah mm -hmm. so they're they've got a guy they're making sure they get their cut they don't even just make sure to get their cut the money doesn't go into the fso bank account first it goes into what's called the flag banking officer he's the representative yeah. for for uh, international finance, it goes into his bank account, and then he decides if he wants to give any of it back to. <laughs> so, okay, so you guys as CIRG members work your asses off, 100 hours a week, 110 hours a week, and then an executive from elsewhere decides whether you get money or not. Yep. And <laughs> did it ever did it ever bother you that you're helping <laughs> produce 2.2 million dollars a week tax-free cash, and you get 50 bucks? It's like, Matt, Matt, look at this. <laughs> I'm going to make $2.2 million tax-free cash this week. You're going to work for me 100 hours. Maybe you get rice and beans. And if I'm in a good mood and everything's right, you get 50 bucks. Yeah. I mean, it's staggering. And the reason I say it is I was a corporate salesperson, okay? And I had a car expense report-based salary. If I sold $2.2 million in a week, I was going to get a lot bigger piece of the pie right? right but see you get so little and yet you give so much you know even not on a personal basis but just like when you do the financial planning and you have the, the head of each of the divisions and they have to go to the financial planning on Thursday night they, they are 
so apathetic about going to that meeting because it doesn't matter if they made 1.3 or they made 2.3. The, the amount of money given back to the organization is almost the same, and it really breaks down to them getting little to nothing for the divisions. So they're like, why the hell am I staying up all night and, you know, doing all this work and come to this stupid meeting when I don't get anything anyway? And what's the difference whether I make 1.5 or 2 million? It, 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 it's not going to change anything for my division. So... Yeah, I'm still not going to get anything. Matt, do you do you lose your reality on money at that level? Does money become unreal? Yeah, it does. It's just numbers, really. You know, because I worked as a DSEMSEC, which is the person over Division Two, which is where the money is, you know, grabbed up and rich, you know, taken from the public. And you're not thinking, you know, it's just numbers in the book that add up. You know, you're trying to get that statistic for the hour, the day, whatever, and you know, ten thousand, twenty thousand, fifty thousand. Doesn't matter. It's it's you, you you lose perspective of the money, and it's a number, and you're trying to get more of it. As a, I was a treasury secretary for uh, seven years, and one of the main jobs as a you know per policy of the treasury secretary, if not the main job, is to make sure there's no free service being given within the organization. Well, there was a problem because Tom Cruise's family was getting over – by the time I re, made a report on it to RTC, they had already gotten over $100,000 worth of free ordering. And policy says you cannot give even a celebrity free ordering. You can give free training, you know, as a gift or something like that. You can give some free training. The free ordering is out of the question. It's, it's against policy. And, you know, nobody could stop it. And nobody wanted to put their finger in the, you know, in the – into it, so I wrote a report and put it to RTC, and, and uh, that was not a good smart move. Boy, but that yeah, that was not a good career move. You're, <laughs> you're, so, in other words, you're the guy. You are the guy who tells David Miscavige that his best friend for life, Tom Cruise, is freeloading and has a hundred thousand dollars in free auditing for him and his family. What happens? What does RC, RTC's reply to you? Um, I basically, you know, get told that. Uh, I can go to the RPF, or I, can, <laughs> or I can go and work at the furniture mill as the lowest post, you know, like the the sweeper of sawdust or something, <laughs> and never have a chance to change the post for the rest of my eternity. So, so you, so you reported Tom for getting a hundred thousand dollars in free. Yeah, it's not him; it's yeah. his family. You know, it's his. his okay, okay, t t Tom and his family in in violation of policy. Right. This is really funny. So David Miscavige, did he order Tom Cruise and his family to get free auditing? I mean, where did the order come from? Or just I mean, what the name that it was under was under the senior CS int, but he wasn't even on post. He was already declared and you know in in the hole somewhere, you know. So David doesn't use his own name on stuff like that, you know. But it's clear to everybody where the freak it's coming from. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, it's that... going too hot, too high, and too hot to to get in the way of. What did you choose? Did you choose to work in the mill or RPF? That was easy. I, I chose the mill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that makes a lot more sense. Now, is that the mill in, in Los Angeles? No, that, it's the mill that's no. in Clearwater. It's on Fort Harrison, right off Fort Harrison Avenue, just about, I don't know, half a mile, three quarters of a mile down the street from the Fort Harrison. And uh, it's quite a big mill. And, you know, it didn't matter what my post title was. I did everything there to make the furniture, obviously. You go from an executive helping to manage $100 million a year plus operation to making furniture. Right. I mean, how did that affect you? You know, I was like, I like I like doing that kind of work. So for me, it was like, you know what, whatever, I'll go down there. I'd love to learn how to make furniture. And, you know, I've always wanted to learn how to do fine uh, furniture work. So, yeah, I was happy um, enough to get out of there. What you're telling me so far, a lot of it is just shocking <laughs> and to it. Can I clarify a couple of things I thought of just so I don't forget? Just go right into okay. it. Okay. One thing is you, when I said in the late uh, 1980s we had about 1,200, 1,300 staff at FLAG, you were saying that, well, there's a lot more there today. And actually there isn't. There's still around 800 to 850 FSO staff, 200 FLAG crew staff, 100 to 150 CMO staff. You had about 10 RTC and then about 25 miscellaneous people from different red units and stuff. So it still comes out to around the same number. What you do have, you have usually uh, a few hundred out-of-org trainees, but they're not flag staff and they're considered uh, flag public, you know. Um, but if you just take flag staff, like people that are CUOC members that are posted at flag, it's still between 1,200 and 1,300 people. 
Well, that's good to know. I thought it was higher. I appreciate the clarification. Matt, you mentioned outer org trainees. Uh -huh. It's been posted online that they basically get treated like slaves. They're often made to, you know, make hotel beds, do gardening. How are outer org, what, what's the, how do outer org trainees live when they're at Flag? Oh, boy. I mean, you got to realize most of these guys, you know, they come from organizations from around the world and that make very little money. Most of the church's organizations make between 2000 and $5,000 a week, which most of it goes, you know, just to pay the the basic bills of the, the place that, you know, if they're lucky, you know, a few hundred bucks will go up to management. And uh, they can't afford to even send the money to, to pay for room and board for their staff members that are getting trained. And if they can't pay for room and board, then these guys need to give their exchange by working a certain amount of hours per day for flag crew. So they'll work in the galley cleaning dishes or they'll be making hotel room beds or, you know, they'll be doing something along that line to uh, basically exchange for their room and board. That's kind of be depressing that your org doesn't have enough money to pay for you to be there. You need to be there to get trained to work for an org that's only going to make a few thousand dollars a week. Mm -hmm. And you might be at <laughs> Flag indefinitely getting trained. And in the meantime, you have to have a part-time job there to keep in your exchange. Yeah, I mean, these guys are so and poor. They're there for so long. A lot of times they don't have money even for soap and shampoo. So what, what gets done is the maids collect the unused soaps and shampoos and, and bathroom items that the public leave in the rooms, and they put those in boxes, and then that gets given out to uh, out org trainees to use for themselves. That's almost something I didn't want to know or wish I'd know, but it goes <laughs> out to <laughs> how depressing it is. There's $1.5 billion on paper I found, and I'm going to keep saying that, right. you know, on the Scientology Money Project. And, oh, by the way, Matt. Yeah. What did you think when I posted the $1.5 billion in 990 T's? What did you think as a finance guy? Yeah, I mean. <clears throat> did you think it was that much? Yeah, I could believe that, in, in, you know, and especially the game they're playing these days. I mean, I'm telling you that these little organizations, these little churches, you know, in these cities around the, the United States, around the world, they're only making chicken feed and sending management, you know, $200, $500 a week. So for all their headache of, of overseeing these guys, they're, they're getting two to five hundred dollars. Well, then they they got this new game, this ideal org, and you have a, a statistic up in management of assets and reserves, like cash and you know assets like buildings. So if you can get the public in these little cities to give you millions of dollars towards a building that is owned not by that local church, but it's owned by in management, that counts. That skyrockets their assets and reserves. Oh, it's a lot easier to get free money than to deliver auditing. Exactly. And and just look at the difference of it. I mean, you might have some, some little St. Louis org that gives them a few thousand dollars a year for managing them, and now all of a sudden they have millions of dollars from that same organization to count as their assets and reserves. So it's major. Do you think the main reason behind Ideal Orgs was just purely financial? Was there ever any real reason? I mean, was it ever true that they really wanted to expand the church through having ideal orgs, or was it just was it just fundraising? You got to understand. Um, see if you can get get this. You you have public that prepay for services, right? Correct. And the money that they give per week, while say they're giving two million dollars per week to the FSO, they're only using maybe 1.2, 1.1. So that means every week you're increasing your debt basically to that public by hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yeah. That's added up over the years to hundreds of millions of dollars just for the flag service organization uh, of money that's on account, unused, that you're supposed to deliver a service for. So that's a liability. In other words, you owe hundreds of millions of dollars in auditing to public. That's right, and services. And then if you take that internationally, now you're heading for like a billion dollars, right, of, of, of money that's not there in the little organizations anymore, but they're supposed to deliver, they're supposed to be able to deliver that, right? It's like a restaurant that took in 
way more money for food that they're going to give in the future to the, the public that come in there, but they've already spent it. They don't have it. So on your books, you have this huge liability. Do you understand? Yeah, but aren't they supposed to keep the money in a bank account and not spend it? Well, it's, you know, you're supposed to, per policy that's been there since the 1960s, if a public hasn't used their service, hasn't used the money, and they want it back, you're supposed to give it back to them. Do you understand that? So, yes. But, but Miscavige changed that in recent years where he won't give the public back their money. He set up some little rigmarole that, it, you know, you got $100,000 on your account. You don't want to, you know, be in Scientology anymore. You want your $100,000 back. And now they tell you, no, you can't have it back unless you go through, you know, some Scientology board that's going to determine whether you could have it or not. And they won't deal with you if you're not a Scientologist in good standing. So it's like a, it's a catch-22, which basically you could, with that think, remove from your books hundreds of millions of dollars worth of, of uh, uh, liability. That is such a runaround. And, and this is one of the problems I think the church is, the church is in trouble for it legally, and I think it's going to get worse right. because it's fraud. So going back to this money thing, basically yeah. from the one point of view, you're saying, good, we don't, that's not a liability anymore. Those hundreds of millions of dollars are not a liability because we don't need to give it back to anybody. And then on the other part of it, you start running what began with superpower building and then, you know, an IS and that, and then running it up to the ideal orgs in the cities where you're now getting, you know, donations for buildings that is assets and reserves that goes to in reserves. So then you're building that up on the other end of it. You understand? So you're, it's like an unusual solution to handle an insolvent church of Scientology. If you take the, the $100,000 in AP, you're saying that Miscavige has decided that they're not going to refund it at all. Therefore, that liability went away. Right. But legally, it doesn't. Or it, according to church policy, they made it go away. If I get in court right now, I mean, you got the Garcias and, and people like that saying, hey, I wanted my money back, and you're telling me I can't have it. You give me the runaround, and it's that's bull crap. And they're fighting it in court with the church right now to, to see if they can break that. Yeah, because it, it if you uh, – yeah, and this is what the Garcia case is alleging, commercial fraud, nothing to do with the religion. What it is is a commercial fraud because if you're on the hook for several hundred million dollars in advance payment, you cannot by ecclesiastic law or fiat say, screw you, we don't owe it to you because civil law doesn't work that way. Right. However, I, I, I know people – here in LA who have been fighting with the church for years to get money back. Right. Now, when you use the word insolvent, do you think the church is insolvent? I think, it, I, I think it was uh, at a point, if you would take all their money that the hundreds of millions that they had taken in advance payments and you weighed that against what they had in cash and had assets, I think it was pretty damn close. What time period was that? I would say like uh, boy, late 90s. So in the late 90s, they're close to insolvent in terms of not having cash. Their liabilities outweigh their cash. Right. Uh, ideal wars could be one solution to becoming solvent again mm -hmm. because it's an, an infusion of fresh cash. Right. All of the hundreds of millions of dollars they took in for advance payment, they spent. Mm -hmm. More or less. Well, what would they have spent it on? Just everyday operations? Yep, and legal, and uh, you know, making the films. Gold eats way more money than it makes. The free wins eats way more money than it makes. I mean, these things are like they just gobbling down. OSA, they don't bring in money, but man, they spend it fast enough. They got all these PIs and lawyers just sucking down that money, and it goes away. What do you think? I mean, even if it's from 1990, ballpark. Mm -hmm. What do you, what do you, how much money do you think the church spends every day? What does it take to run the Church of Scientology for one day, ballpark? Man, I don't know. I'd have to sit down and really work that over my head, but uh, I don't know. I really don't know. Why, what, well, what does it take, what did it take for one day in the 90s to run FLAG? I mean, just the, the FLAG service organization, I mean, you, you got the 300000 for the financial planning. You get, we were giving back to public about 100000 a week for, like, where they would say, I don't want to be in a church anymore, give me my money back. That was an average, probably pretty close to 100000 a week. Um, you have, I mean, a hunk of that goes to OSA, 
you know, local, a hunk of that goes to OSA International, a hunk of that goes to to the rights, to, to, it goes basically to Golden Era Studios because, you, you know, the rights to use their films and stuff like that for training. I mean, it, it's got all kinds of labels on it, but it gets yeah. basically flag fun Scientology International. I mean, you have more than half of the total amount of money that comes into Scientology and over half of the total amount of delivery by Scientology internationally is done at FLAG. Uh, Matt, did you blow or did you route out of the Sea Org? I routed out. How long did routing out take? Well, it would have taken forever, but I kind of put my foot down. Um, I had tried to route out from the organization like about three years prior to when I left, and it's, it's really impossible. You get sent out to the Hacienda, and uh, you're put in pig's birthing, which is basically a room that has no carpet. It's been, you know, flooded. It's got mold. It doesn't have air conditioning. It doesn't have a window. And you're supposed to, like, sleep like a bum in there. And they'll, like, get back to you. Except that if you're, if you require an order of a certain level, like a certain expertise, there's ready orders, orders from RTC that those orders never ordered staff. So you have nobody who can do the leaving sex check on you. So you are just left there indefinitely, and food is dropped, if you're lucky, out by the pool on some pan that you can go grab it off of like a, a rat. And you either have a choice of blowing or go back on post. It, it was literally made impossible to get out of there. And when I finally was get, getting out, I was from, getting out from the RPF, and the RPF has its own internal auditors that can audit you so you can leave, but it was being overseen in such a way that there was no way I was going to be let out. Uh, the question that was being asked, have you ever committed an overt, which means have you ever done something wrong, which you're going to go on forever and ever, and, you know, you're eating rice and beans three times a day, you're under guard, you're under multiple guards when you're sleeping and stuff, um, and it goes on for weeks, and finally I just got upset. I was in the auditing session, it's being videoed to go to RTC, and I just lost it, and I just said, that's the, basically F it, you know? I said, uh, you have until 12 o'clock tomorrow afternoon to get me and Amy out of here, or we are walking out through the gate. I said, there ain't no security guard, there ain't no fence, there ain't nothing you have that's going to stop me unless you shoot me in the head. And wow. that was it, threw the cans down. So <laughs> by 12 o'clock, they knew I was not kidding. And by 12 o'clock the next day, I was out of there. Well, that is just pure uh, command intention, so to speak. Yeah, that was it. I, I wasn't, there w wasn't going to be anything past 12 o'clock the next day. I, I would have done whatever I needed to do to get out of there. Look at what they do. It's like getting a refund is a catch-22. Leaving Sea Org is a catch-22. It's a series of impossible situations. Right. Now, when you were... At Flag Land Base in Pig's Birthing, just on a practical matter, do you get a blanket and a pillow? I mean, how do you sleep on a concrete floor? What do they actually give you to sleep Yeah, with? there was a mattress in there or something, but, I mean, it's nasty. Ass. <laughs> I mean, Florida's hot, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and there's big cockroaches. Yeah. And uh, they don't – this is something that, that the church doesn't understand or it fails to understand – it's it's cruel, uh, it's inhumane to make people live like that. Yeah, none of the other staff or your friends or anybody will talk to you. You're like, you know, there's a whole social thing to it, also a whole mind bend. You know, these are the people that you've worked with for decades, and nobody will look at you or whatever. You know, you, you're just, you're, you're a non-person. Well, it's very much like a, a caste system. Right. You're, you're lower caste, you're... Uh, someone to be rejected, despised. Right. You're the lowest of the low because you want to leave Sea Org. And generally when you leave Sea Org, aren't you considered a degraded being? Yeah, for policy, for LRH, if you leave the Sea Org, you are a degraded being. Matt, what would you say to people who are still in the church deciding whether or not to leave? I mean, I would tell them to get, you know, just stop for a minute and stop justifying outnesses that they see. And just stop and look at the whole overall picture, gather information, and then and judge for themselves, you know. But you can't judge without collecting information, you know, and looking at it and judging in, for yourself. You know, I think one of the 
the hard things too is for the, those people out there who have family members that are in. You know, they're not Scientologists. Or maybe they they were Scientologists, or maybe they still are Scientologists. But they know that they have family members, children, etc., that are still in the Sea Org, and they're getting manipulated and they're, they're getting control with you know information control. And I, I really, I, you know, I know a lot of these people. Like, how do I help this person? How do I get them out? And uh, you know, it's a, it's a real problem. I don't, you know, I don't have an easy solution for them. Well, no, there's not. So that leads me to ask, in conclusion, two questions. What was the hardest part of leaving the Church of Scientology? Well, I don't know. I think it's it's psychological mostly. You know, it's psychological. You've you got to kind of. <laughs> you gotta gotta kind of get out of the whole mind trap of it, and uh, yeah, it, you know, you're starting a whole new adventure. You're going out into life with, uh, you know, without money, without having uh, credit, without having uh, a background of employment. Um, you know, so it's some people they're stuck. They don't have a family member to go to. They have nothing. They have no way to get out of there. They want to get out of there, but they can't get out of there. There's a lot of that. Believe me. Oh, I, I, I know, and you, you, you make the path by walking it, as the old Eastern saying has it. The other question, Matt, what is the easiest part about leaving the Church of Scientology? I mean, the easiest part is is realizing you're in a trap. At some point, you realize you're trapped, and you need to get out, that it's, 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 uh, it's a dead end. And the, work, the longer you stay in there, the worse it's going to be. It's kind of like... Uh, a train that's getting faster and faster and faster is never a good time to jump off, but it's only going to get worse, and you need to get out of there, you know, at some point. So you, you know, you got to just take the jump and go from there, you know. Yeah, the first few days that you're out or the first few weeks, when does it hit you that you're free? When did it hit you that you are truly free? Immediately, as soon as I get on that bus. I mean, I, I, I felt so happy, so relieved. Declared, not declared, I don't care. I, I, lived, I would have left one of my legs there. It was like I felt so good, so happy, and it never stopped. I mean, you know, I went and found Amy. We went and got married. You know, we went and got a, a job. You know, we, we started off just doing minimum wage, and, you know, we just worked away along and just, you know, got an apartment once we had a, uh, some, you know, pay slips. And it was, just, it was just a big crate. We did real good, and it was just happy and fun, really. Man, that's a phenomenal story, and I'd love to have you back on the air sometime to get more details about Flag Land Base. Love to have Amy on the air. Thank you so much for your time and courage in speaking out. It, it is an inspiration to people still in our people who are still under the radar. And uh, all I have to say is thank you. I enjoyed the time went by too fast. Now I can tell you one other thing: if there's a Sea Org member, Please. somebody who's thinking about getting out, and they don't know how they would survive. Besides there being people out here that would help them, the FBI has a, a unit that's called Human Tra handles human trafficking, and they will help you. They will find you a job. They will give you money. They will give you a house to live in a place to live in. They will they will help you. They 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 asked me and Amy if we wanted those kind of things and. We said no because we had already, you know, gotten on our feet and stuff like that. But they would be just too ha happy to help somebody who is escaping from the CO. Now, how do you how do you find details on the human trafficking help? Do you go to the FBI website? Yeah, you can just call the FBI office locally, wherever, and just tell them, you know, what your scene is, and and you need help, and they'll they'll connect you up. Well, that's very important to know, and that can mean the difference between someone leaving and not leaving. I hope the church makes sweeping humanitarian changes, but do you think that's possible that they could change? Nope, it's totally impossible. They will never change. They will never even that, they will never even admit that they ever did a single thing wrong. I mean, no, if they were standing in a lake and you told them they were wet, they would say no, they never got wet in their life. They just there's no there's no taking any responsibility for anything. Do you see the whole Church of Scientology eventually just cratering? You know, it's already cratering. It's getting smaller and weaker and, and more well-known for its criminality. And, and uh, you know, I don't think it'll ever be gone. It just keeps getting weaker and smaller and, you know, and people are more aware of what they are. So, just Yeah, and, ma and many have said that it, it, it goes the way of Christian science. There's still a lot of small Christian science reading rooms. Right. There's one nearby where Karen and I live. And 
their their reminders of a bygone era where Mary Baker Eddy was a bigger name than L. Ron Hubbard. Right. And these little reading rooms are just a crumbling real estate empire that remains. And maybe they go the way of Christian science. Uh, time will tell. I, what I've written and what I believe, Matt, is that cults always end badly. Right. And the Church of Scientology is a cult, and it's going to end badly. Yep. I don't know how, but it will end badly. So we'll leave it there. Thank you for your time, Matt. You're very welcome. For, for Surviving Scientology Radio, this is your host, Jeffrey Augustine. We're available online at survivingscientologyradio.com and on iTunes, where we dominate the search word Scientology. Thank you for listening, and as always, we'll be in very good touch.